As we've been praying, prepping for this upcoming uh, next little bit, this term saying, what is it that God wants us to say? We felt like we're in this series prepared for purpose and we felt like it was time to press pause on that. Uh, Not because it's not awesome and we will come back to that. We will look at the life of David again between those two windows. But we just felt like in light of how noisy our world is right now and and in light of what's happening in the church as well, there's so much change going on for those of you who are a part of it. You know, we're going through this voting process. Well, I'm going through a, potentially a voting process. There's a lot happening. We just felt like it was really important that as a whole church, Vedan and Allgate, that we came together and aligned on a series. So we, we're going to pause prepared for purpose and we're bringing a series which we're calling DNA. Everyone say DNA where we are looking at what is the stuff that unites us? What are, what are we align on? I was, I was thinking about, you know, the idea of the noise, and you might have heard that in recent times there's been a virus which has caused some consternation amongst some folk, and there's been some other things going on. And it, I think change and distraction and everything happening around us, it can, be, it can be a little bit like two people singing a different song at the same time. You ever done that? You know when, some, when you're trying to think of a song but there's a song playing on the radio? Anyone ever been there? And you cannot for the life of you think of that song because this song's playing. It's a bit, we had my mum's birthday about a month ago and we were sitting there singing uh, happy birthday and the kids have started this thing before you sing happy birthday, they all just start going, ah, and they hold it for as long as we can while they're lighting the candles. And Benj did a classic thing. We're all waiting for happy, but Ben just goes, Ah, cements, yeah, missy, oh, da, da. <laughs> From the Lion King, those of you who haven't seen that. And it was classic. We all lost it, thought it was hilarious. But it completely distracted us from the primary purpose of why we were there, which was to declare happy birthday to my mother. Um, and I think it can be like that, particularly in church, particularly in life, where we have this mission from God, we have a mandate from God, He's called us to be a family on mission, the church, calling us to go and make disciples, but so often we can get so distracted and confused by everything else around us that we so easily forget who we are and we forget why we do what we do. So we felt it's important to take some time to come back to that and align ourselves on who we are and why we do what we do. And we are not talking about deoxyribose nucleic acid, nucleic acid, scientists. We're talking about a different kind of DNA. That DNA, let me read it because I stuffed this up in the first service. DNA is a double helix protein that exists in every cell and carries all the information required for that cell to develop, function, and enable an organism to become what it was created to be. Too much for a Sunday morning? Science lesson, let me put it this way. It's the stuff in us that shapes the stuff about us. That's how my mind works. DNA is the stuff in us that shapes the stuff about us, right? And as a church, we have a DNA. You know, as a family, you have a DNA. Your DNA comes from your parents. Their DNA comes from their parents. And so when you have a look at it, you can tell who you are and where you come from based on what's inside of you. The same is true for church, we have a DNA. We don't, it's not deoxyribose nucleic acid. It's what we call our core values. It's the stuff that undergirds us. It's the, the things that are, that are deeply held values within us. And they tell us who we are and where we come from. Tell us why we do what we do. They unite us and they become the bedrock on which we stand. Are you with me? As a church, we have a DNA. We have core values values. And we felt it was important in this season to come around that DNA and look at our core values. And we've got seven of them as Hills Baptist, and we're going to spend a few weeks unpacking them. Today, we're going to have a look at two. And the first two are these. One, we are Christ-centered. This is our phrase. Christ is our cornerstone, the foundation that our faith is built on. We desire to follow His example as we seek to live as children of God. Number two, we are biblically based or founded or grounded. We believe the Bible is the infallible Word of God. Amen. It equips, guides, and corrects us in every aspect of our lives. These are what we call our foundational values, that we are Christ-centered and biblically based. 
You know, when I was 21 years old, I went uh, with some mates to a conference in Melbourne, and it was a senior pastor's conference. And I was an education student. And we thought, there was four of us, we thought it would be a great idea because we loved the preacher. We knew the preacher. He was early 70s, very famous, well-known all over the world. And he's like my ministry here. I desperately wanted to go and hear him while he was in Australia. So we just jumped in the car and we drove over to this conference thinking, yep, we can get into a senior pastor's conference. No worries at all. 21-year-old education students. And by the grace of God, they were okay with us going. We kind of sat mainly at the back as this guy ministered to about five or 600 senior leaders in the church from all around Australia. And then there was us. And it was so special. And I remember uh, just being in awe of this guy, loving what God had done through his life for so many years. But the most profound message didn't come through him. It came through his son. Because he brought his son to preach because he said he, at 70 years old, he couldn't preach three days straight, multiple messages every day. He needed to go home and have a nap. And so his son came in and sort of preached in between. And initially everyone was like, oh, we want you. And then we realized, oh, it's not dependent upon you. It's the word of God. Anyway, and so his son gets up and preaches. And I'll never, ever, ever forget this message. Because his son was leading a church in America of around four, 500 people. And uh, he got up and he started sharing about how he took over this church. And he was like, man, I want to build a great church. I want to build a church that's going to impact the world. I want to build a church that's going to see lives change. Our statement is Jesus glorified, lives transformed, hope revealed. I want to build a a church that means something in the world. And he's like, so that's what we're going to do. And in order to do that, I'm going to go to a conference and I'm going to learn how to do it. So he went to a conference. He got all inspired, you know, great messages. He got all the gear that you need. They signed up to all the emails. They signed up to the training. They did all of that gear. He came home. He said to his elders, he goes, guys, I've got it. We're going to become a purpose-driven church. Anybody been there? Purpose-driven church. Great book. And so he did all of that. They ramped it up. They prepped it all. They had months in the lead up and they were going to launch this purpose-driven church. This is who we are. And the launch date came and he said a bunch of people walked in, but interestingly, a bunch of people walked out because they're like, we don't want to be a purpose-driven church. We just want to be who we are, who God's called us to be. And so they started this purpose-driven church journey for a while and it was going okay, but numbers were kind of dwindling and he was getting a bit discouraged. So he thought, I know what I got to do. I got to go to another conference. So we went to another conference and he got all inspired, heard these preachers, heard these speakers talking about this stuff and he signed up to the emails and got all the paraphernalia and was really keen and excited and he came back to his elders and said, I know what the plan is. What we're going to, we're going to be a seeker sensitive church. So they put it all together and they planned it all and they had a launch date and they spent months prepping it and then they launched it. And the day that they became a seeker-sensitive church, there was a bunch of people who walked in and there was a whole bunch of people who walked out because they didn't want to be a seeker-sensitive church. They wanted to be a purpose-driven church. And if they didn't want to be a purpose-driven church, they wanted to be the other church that they always were. And so they walked out. And he got a bit discouraged and a bit despondent and the months went on and it wasn't really working and numbers were dwindling a little bit. And he thought, I know what I need to do. I need to go to another conference. So we went to another conference and he heard these great speakers and he was inspired and he got fired up and all the stuff happened and he came back to his elders. He said, I know what we're going to do. I know the answer. We're going to become an emerging church. We're going to get rid of the chairs. We're going to put sofas and we're going to have all, you know, it's going to be really just hip and easy and relaxed and no one will stand up to talk. We'll all sit down and be chilled and it's going to be great. And so they became the emerging church and guess what happened? Some people came in. A bunch of people walked out. And so then he got a bit despondent, got a bit, you know, downhearted, and he went to another conference. He went to this conference, and he got all fired up, and he came back to his elders, and he said, I know what the answer is. We're going to become a house church church. We're going to be built around house churches, and 
all this sort of gear. And so they launched that and all the seeker-sensitive people left because they didn't want that. They wanted the seeker-sensitive stuff. The purpose-driven people had still hung around, had gone because they wanted to be that. The people who were with them at the beginning started to leave because they're like, we don't even know who we are. And the whole thing started to fall in a heap and a mess. And the church that was four or 500 was now a church of around 100 to 150. And he was just so despondent. And so he was praying about it and he saw this ad for this great conference. So he went to his elders and said, guys, there's this great conference I want to go to. And apparently the elders said to him, mate, like, pastor, we love you. You know when someone says that. But... <laughs> We don't think we can handle another conference. He goes, no, no, this is going to be good. This is the answer. This is where we're going to hear from God. So he went to this conference and he said, I'll never forget this. He said he was sitting there watching this conference and on the first night, a choir of over 200 people rose from a platform beneath the stage on hydraulics, (laughs) elevated up above everything that was happening and they're singing. And he said, in that moment, he just broke down into tears. And he said, if this is what it takes to be a church that impacts its community and the world, I don't have what it takes and I'm done. He said he got up and he walked out and he went to his hotel room and he just started crying out to God, just started crying, 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 started saying how God had let him down, how God had given him this call to lead and none of it had worked and You know, he thought he was doing the right thing, all these conferences, all this stuff. He thought God had shown him that and God had let him down. And he said he got to the end of tears where there were no tears left and he was just numb. And in that moment, he heard the still small voice of God lead him to one of the most glorious passages of Scripture. And I realize I say that every time I'm up here, (laughs) but it truly is. He opened the word to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. It says, but as for you, and this is Paul talking to Timothy. This is Paul, the great apostle who is in prison, writing the last letter he will ever write, the last words he will ever pen, on sentence of death, about to be beheaded, and an urgency in his voice. Don't read 2 Timothy lightly. When you read 2 Timothy, you hold it with very special care. Here he is. He comes to almost the end of the letter. It's the last thing. What is my last word of advice? For as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know from those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now watch this. In the presence of God, And of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing, he's coming back and he's establishing his kingdom. In view of him, in view of Christ and who he is and the fullness of who he is, I give you this solemn charge. Preach the word. Preach the word. In view of him, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And so it goes on. And I will never forget that moment in time as a 21-year-old sitting in the back of a room full of church leaders who were far older than me, knowing that I'm just about to go into teaching, not ministry. I didn't get called into ministry for another 12 years after that moment. But in that moment, it was as if the Lord took that passage and just seared it into my soul. Preach the word. In season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage. Preach the word. And I'll never forget from that moment on with tears in his eyes, this guy got up and he started talking about how... What the Lord laid on his heart was, how about you just become a Christ-centered church? How about 
You just do what I've called you to do all along, which is come follow me. How about you preach Jesus? How about you go to Genesis 1 and you realize that all of Scripture is God-breathed and all of it points to Jesus and you just preach the Word? And apparently he went back to his church and the elders were kind of cowering, you know, afraid of what they were going to be now. And they said, what are we going to be now, Pastor? And he said, we're going to be a Christ-centered church. We're going to go to Genesis 1 and we're going to teach the Bible and we're going to love people. And we're going to let God do what he wants to do. And then he shocked all of us because he said to us from the pulpit, this is a man teaching senior pastors, five, six hundred of them in a room. And he goes, that was 12 months ago. And in the course of 12 months, the church hadn't blown up to thousands of people. But he said for the very first time in a very long time, it's healthy. People are getting saved. Disciples are being made. The gospel is being proclaimed. And then someone heard me preach and asked me to come and speak at this conference. He goes, and it's not good conference preaching. It's not sexy. You want your 12 steps to how to build a bigger church? I'm not giving you that. It's not popular. I'm definitely not going to sell any books. But be a Christ-centered church. And I'll never, ever forget it. And it has been seared into my soul. And as we come to our values, first and foremost, I want to say to you that we desire above all things to be a Christ-centered church. A cross-centered church. That is who we are. That is who we will always be. And if we ever get off track, you have permission to come with a spiritual piece of 4 before and smack me over the head. Be a Christ-centered church. Why a Christ-centered church, friends? Well, I could explain it or I could let Paul and John, and they're probably better than me, so let's let them. Ephesians 1, 20, 23 says this, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet. All things are under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. No one else, Christ. He's the head, which is his body. The church is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. The Son, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created. If you are not underlining in this, your, this in your Bible, you need to. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's trying to make a really important statement that Jesus is the center of everything. You are not. I am not. He is. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. You wouldn't have breath if it wasn't for him holding you together right now. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on a cross, be a cross-centered Church, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life and that life was the light of mankind. That light has shone in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. Verse 14, the word became flesh. Christ-centered church. Revelation 1, 17, I am the first and the last. 
I'm a living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever and I hold the keys to death and Hades. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. John 8, 58, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the means through which all things were created and He is the reason by which all things were created. He is not only the head of the church, He is the sustainer and sufficiency of the church. He is why we exist. We are to be a Christ-centered church. And by church, I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about a body. The people of God are supposed to be so enamoured with Jesus, not drawn, not, not coming to consume. We talked about this recently. We're not a restaurant. You don't come and go, well, that I like and that I don't like and there's enough stuff I like that I'll stick around. No, we are a body that is centered in Christ. He is the one that unites us. There might be things we don't like about it. We might not like the way that the thumb cuts its nail. That's okay because Christ is the center. Come on, somebody. That's who we are, a Christ Centered church, that is what we are called to be. Now, how do we become a Christ centered church? Well, let's go back to 2 Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his, so in view of who he is, in view of the fact that he's the center, I give you this solemn charge preach the word. It's not just, I just give you this encouragement. It's I give you a solemn charge. You know, when I do a wedding, we start with a solemnization. Everyone say solemnization. What it means is to explain the seriousness of the covenant you're entering into. Braden and Bella are about to get married. We've talked about this. They love it. We talk about the seriousness of what we're entering into. It's a charge. So when Paul says, Timothy, I'm giving you this solemn charge, I am solemnizing the situation. I am telling you that there's gonna be ups and downs. It's not gonna be easy. But friend, I'm about to die and I'm handing the baton over to you. This is significant. This is serious. Preach the word. You wanna see the church? You wanna see the gospel go forth? You wanna see the power of God moving on the earth? You wanna see change and transformation? You wanna see the kingdom of heaven made manifest, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Don't preach what you wanna preach. Don't stand up here and do a performance. Preach the word. It's not about lights. It's not about the show. It's not about coffee. It's not about any of those things. It's about Jesus and he is revealed in the preaching of his word. Preach the word. I'm trying to hold it together. I I spoke at a youth camp many years ago, which Laura was worship leading out with Adzi. And I got up there after spending months prepping, five messages for young people. And this person at the back said to me, we've got traffic lights back here for you. There's a green light, an orange light, and a red light. You're gonna have green for 15 minutes. When you get to 15, we'll put the orange one on. At 20, it will go red. And if you get to 22, it will flash at you and you need to get off. I said to him, I don't get through my introduction in 22 minutes. (laughs) No, I didn't. But I did pause and breathe. And I believe I said something along the lines of this. You will not flash that red light at me. I have prepped and I have prayed and I have sought God for a word for these young people. And I don't care what you have next, baking muffins or tying ribbons, that will not change these kids' lives. Community is important. We're gonna talk about that in a few weeks' time as a value. But the thing that changes lives is the power of God through the word of God. So I said, if it takes me 28 minutes to get there, we're going to do it for 28 minutes. I'll be respectful. I'll acknowledge there's other stuff in the program. 
but you're not flashing a red light at the Word of God. Preach the Word. It is a serious thing to do. Now, what is Timothy saying about all of this? He's saying, why, why, why do we preach? Why do we preach the Word of God? Because the Word of God is truth. And because Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Here's what we have to understand, that it's in the preaching of the Word, in the proclamation of truth, not just the preaching of a a fun, nice message that I want people to hear. No, in the proclamation of the Word, Christ is revealed. This is not about information. We don't come here, you don't get around the Word so you can know more stuff. No, we come around the Word of God so that there will be a revelation of who He is. It's an encounter with God. This is God's desire from the dawn of time. When He created, He created the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is a tabernacle. A tabernacle is the place where God's presence dwells. Humanity dwelt with God. That is His intention. How did that go wrong? We believed a lie. And because we believed a lie and we set ourselves up as God, from that moment on, that presence was severed. What does God do? He comes and He brings a word. And in bringing the word to Moses, He then establishes the law and a means by which we can access the presence of God. It goes on and on and on. And then Christ comes as the word. The word comes to humanity, suffers and dies. Why? So that we could engage His presence. The ministry of the gospel is a word ministry. I don't have time to explain that in more detail, but it is a word ministry. We have been given the word. This is not a book. This is a revelation. This is not information. This is a means to an encounter with the living God. That's why we preach it. That's why it's important. When we read it, you're not just reading Clancy, whatever her name's latest novel. You are reading God's very word to his people and it is good and it is useful for an encounter with the living God. So we come for an encounter. Truth is revealed and the Spirit of God who takes the word of God and manifests it in our heart, the Spirit is called a Spirit of truth. The Spirit points to the word. One of my favourite theologians, Alastair Begg, says this. He says, the word of God does the work of God by the Spirit of God in the people of God. And then he says, the primary objective is that the Word of God may create by the Spirit of God a divine encounter with God Himself. As Geordie said when he was leading before, we come with an invitation to encounter the living God. And when we come with that posture, radical transformation happens. I saw it last weekend with a bunch of young people surrendering their lives to Christ. We saw it two weekends ago with a bunch of young people surrendering their lives to Christ. We see it all of the time. But what would it look like if the people of God truly came to the presence of God hungry? Total transformation and change. Charles Spurgeon, and I'll close in a minute because the kids are going crazy, but Charles Spurgeon once said this. He tells this story that a lady in his church came along and was complaining that his messages were too similar. Now, if you don't know who Charles Spurgeon is, he's known as the Prince of Preachers, right? He's a Baptist. We call him Spurge. (laughs) The Prince of Preachers. Famous for his eloquence, famous for being able to stand without a microphone in front of thousands of people and proclaim the gospel. And this lady came and complained, your messages are all the same. And he said, too right. He's like, because I start with a text and I make a beeline for the cross. That's what we should be doing because Jesus is the revelation of truth. He is truth. So as truth is proclaimed, Christ is revealed. So every message should point to Jesus. Everything we do, this is so important. And how are we to do it? How are we to do it? We're supposed to do it by correcting, rebuking, and encouraging in season, out of season. doesn't matter what the times are. Are they good? Are they bad? Are we in the middle of a pandemic? 
Or maybe in the future, we're flowing in the blessing of God with a building from God and everything's going well. It doesn't change what we do. We preach the Word and we preach Christ and we do it by correcting, rebuking and encouraging. There are going to be times in this church when the Word's going to sting. But guess what? It's for your good and for His glory. And if it stings you, it's stinging me. There are going to be times when you leave this place, hopefully, where you're like, yeah, come on. Don't be offended by my enthusiasm. It's because I love Jesus. My heart is that we would all be enthusiastic and passionate about the things of God because Jesus is the centre of everything. This is what we're called to. We're called to that life. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience. Why? Because a time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head. In all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and discharge the duties of your ministry. We are living in these times. We have always lived in these times. We are always wanting to chase after someone who will tell me what I want to hear. The Word of God is alive and active and our job is not to preach what is culturally appropriate or politically correct. Our job is to proclaim the truth of the gospel, of the Word of God, who Jesus is. It is a rock of offence, but He is the salvation of God for all who would believe. No one likes to hear that you are dead without Christ. It's a very unpopular message. But that doesn't mean it's not true. Yeah? We now live in a world where no one wants to say no. No is a loving thing to say, especially when someone's careering towards an oncoming freight train. We are to proclaim the truth of the gospel. Can I make it more clear? That's who we are. Romans 10 13 to 15, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It's good news that we bring. Friends, this is why we teach. This is why our youth ministry preaches every Friday. This is why our small groups open the Word of God and talk. This is why our kids ministry teaches the Bible and doesn't just play games. This is why on a Sunday we prioritize the proclamation of the Word of God. This is why when we run Awaken, we teach the Word of God, because the Word of God has the power to do the work of God by the Spirit of God in the people of God. Full stop. Amen. Hallelujah. We will Proclaim the goodness of God through His Word and we need to understand that in so doing, Christ is revealed and the people of God encounter the presence of God, which is His great desire for us. I'm gonna close. Sophie's gonna play and we're gonna shift into a time of communion. And we're gonna do it differently today. Normally we get up, we walk and take it. But what I want you to do is get up, go and grab your COVID safe communion. It's a new and innovative thing. And come back and take your seat. And we're gonna do this together. So hop up, go and grab. There's uh, gluten-free at the back. And then come back to your seat. And we'll have a look at this.
kids and mums and dad, you're doing so well. I know some of you are excited for kids ministry next week. But there's something special about just having kids running around here in the Word. So we come to communion. And the interesting thing about one of the things we do is we remember the solemn charge that what Christ did for us, again, it's not sexy, but it's serious. And they gave, Christ himself gave us a way to come under that authority, to remember this serious work that he did. And he wants us to do it regularly. And so as a church, we come around something, it's not just a religious thing we do. This is a way of remembering that the presence of God comes to the people of God. And we take communion. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the wafer and we're going to remember all that Christ has done for us in making a way where there was no way. Let's eat together. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim, declare, preach the Lord's death until he comes. This is a way of proclaiming the truth of the gospel to each other, the presence of each other, that this is what Christ has done. So let's stand to our feet and let's drink in remembrance of all He has done, proclaiming the goodness of His grace to us. And with that proclaimed, let me finish with this. Because in Colossians 6, it's Colossians 3 verse 15, 16, Paul says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message, the Word of Christ, dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish another with all wisdom. And we like to pause there, but it doesn't pause there. It says, With all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. This is why church is important because it's not very often that I walk up to Chris and just be like, hello, Jesus loves you. It's not often we sing to each other the goodness of God, but we do that here. And that's why this is important. That's why the Sunday is important. The gathering's important because it's also the place where the Word of God is proclaimed through the song of the people of God. So sing it out. If you've got a mask on, Belt it out through that thing. Let's sing the goodness of God and proclaim the Word and bearing witness that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Amen? Amen. You've been listening to a sermon from Hills Baptist Church. To find out more or to hear other great content, find us at hillsbaptist.com or on your podcast app.